Close enough. Yeah. Good evening, I'm Mike Wallace. Welcome to the Gotham Center for New York City History, the uh, second forum of the fall season. Uh, in advance notice, our third forum will be on Monday at 6.30, just around the corner in the Siegel Theater. So please join us, you don't have to register for it, uh, but do come early if you wanna make sure you get in uh, and, and get a seat. Um, uh, I'm welcoming you also on behalf of Suzanne Wasserman, who's the director of the Gotham Center, who is where? There. Ah, here she is. Ah, okay. It's the Edgar Allan Poe, hide in plain sight. Um, uh, and Suzanne asked me to uh, remind people that this particular program is part of the Graduate Center's Public Program Initiative Cultural Capital, The Promise and Price of New York's Creative Economy. She also asked me to remind you that we, uh, as always, are deeply appreciative of any donations that could be made to the Gotham Center uh, to carry on our various programs. And um, if anybody is feeling so inclined and has a checkbook, handy. Uh, you can find Suzanne currently down here, but maybe a target in motion, uh, and, and pass it over to her. And uh, our immense thanks to those who have heeded prior calls and given us some aid. Um, oh, uh, here's the what's happening on Monday. Uh, on Monday, uh, Carla Kaplan is going to talk about her new book, Miss Anne in Harlem, The White Women of the Black Renaissance. She offers a new perspective of the 1920s in this lively, groundbreaking group biography that uncovers for the first time the untold story of the white women of the Black Harlem Renaissance. While every other imaginable form of female identity in the Jazz Age has been studied, the flapper, the Gibson girl, the bachelor girl, the bohemian, the 20s, mannish, lesbian, the suffragist, the untold story of the white women of Black Harlem, the women collectively referred to as Miss Anne, has never been uncovered until now. Miss Anne in Harlem brings to life an extraordinary group of women. Okay, now, tonight. Uh, we are pleased to have Mason Williams here to discuss his new book, City of Ambition, FDR, LaGuardia, and the Making of Modern New York. Mason got his PhD in history last year from Columbia University, where his dissertation won the Bancroft Dissertation Prize, and well merited it was. It's a splendid piece of work. He is now a Schwartz postdoctoral fellow at the New York Historical Society and the New School. Uh, his uh, uh, book, uh, which we'll be talking about tonight, was published by W.W. Norton at the end of May. Um, Mason uh, once it noted that he is a proud alumnus of the spring 2008 iteration of HIST 75800, which he reminds me uh, is a graduate seminar on 20th century New York City history that I teach from time to time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, only other note of consequence is uh, that Mason will talk for around 43 minutes, he advises me, uh, pl plus or minus two. Uh, and after that, we'll uh, have a q and A. I'll repeat this at the end, but C-SPAN is taping uh, this event, a measure of its uh, national significance. Uh, and uh, so we, even more than normally, ask people who are going to ask questions or make comments to come to one of the mics on either side so you can be immortalized, or at least the back of your head can be immortalized uh, on, on uh, national TV. Um, that's all, folks. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm looking forward to this and looking forward to hearing what you think about all of it after. Um, before I begin, let me say a quick uh, thanks to Mike and Suzanne, not only for inviting me tonight, which is a real honor for me, but um, also for keeping this institution uh, up and going and developing it and so forth. If, you know, I was thinking what my own experience as a historian of New York City would be like without the Gotham Center, and that thought alone, I think, will sort of, uh, you know, help you to envision what the enterprise of New York City history uh, would be like without this. It'll give you a sense of the value uh, of the thing. But um, 
This talk is drawn, as Mike said, from a book I've just published about Franklin Roosevelt, Fiorello LaGuardia, and the New Deal in New York City. I'm going to begin by reading a couple pages in order to frame the rest of the talk, and I'll pick up the story from there. Um, the book goes through 1945. Uh, and uh, rather than race through all of that, I'm going to focus on one single large important part of it, which is how the federal government's response to the problem of unemployment in the 1930s uh, reframed what was politically and governmentally possible uh, in New York City. Lift the microphone up a little. OK. Today, many New Yorkers take the FDR to get to LaGuardia. <laughs> you didn't know this would be comedy, did you? Uh, if their journeys originate in Manhattan, north of 42nd Street, they may pass beneath Carl Schurz Park en route to the Triborough Bridge, which will carry them over the sites of the old Randalls Island Stadium and the Astoria Pool before depositing them on Long Island. If they leave from south of 42nd Street, they may cross under the East River by way of the Queens Midtown Tunnel, entering the borough of Queens not far south of the Queens Bridge houses and passing within a few blocks of William Cullen Bryant High School. These and many similar structures are physical remnants of a time when the federal government under Franklin Roosevelt met the greatest domestic crisis of the 20th century by putting unemployed men and women to work on public projects largely designed and carried out by local governments. In New York City, Roosevelt's partner was Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Other monuments from this time remain linchpins of the city's infrastructure. The Lincoln Tunnel, Henry Hudson Drive, the Belt Parkway, countless more stretching from Orchard Beach in the Bronx to Franklin Delano Roosevelt Boardwalk on Staten Island's South Shore have become part of the landscape within which life is lived in New York. In a city whose favorite amusements have long included putting up and pulling down, these projects have endured. And yet, if the physical legacy of the New Deal still pervades the city, the history that produced it is only dimly understood. The public works projects of the 1930s stand today as mute testaments to an era of tumults and creativity, and to a conception of government which reached its apotheosis in interwar America and which shaped New York City profoundly, but whose history, obscured in turns by ideology and neglect, is too little understood. This book is an account of the relationship between two of the most remarkable political leaders of the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, and Fiorello LaGuardia, the 99th Mayor of New York City. The products of starkly different personal backgrounds and different reform traditions, they rose in counterpoint through the ranks of New York politics before coming together in the 1930s to form a political collaboration unique between a national and a local official. Sworn in as the executives of America's two largest governments at the depths of the Great Depression, they kept the nation's biggest city together during one of the most trying periods in its history and helped establish the course of its politics in the post-war decades. This is also a study of how government came to play an extraordinarily broad role in a quintessentially market-oriented city, of how the public sphere, embodied physically in the structures and spaces built up and carved out in the 1930s, was forged. This story has its roots in the progressive era, which marked the beginning of a decades-long debate over the ideal relationship between individual society and government. In a modern, interdependent society, what rights did each of these groups possess, and what responsibilities? And how could collective action be deployed in the interest of social progress? Particularly in urban politics, the progressive era witnessed the introduction of a new set of policy approaches meant to improve the quality of urban life mitigate the social costs of capitalist urban development, and render government more efficient and effective. A crucial moment in this history came in the 1930s. During that turbulent decade, Franklin Roosevelt and his Democratic Party chose to channel the resources of the federal government through the agencies of America's cities and counties. Fiorello LaGuardia's coalition of reformers, Republicans, social democrats, and leftists rebuilt New York's local state chasing the functionaries of the city's fabled Tammany Hall political machine from power and implanting a cohort of technical experts committed to expanding the scope of the public sector. 
As depression gave way to war, the experience of total mobilization politicized market transactions, allowing grassroots activists and political leaders alike to make fair employment and fair prices a central part of city politics. So that's what the book is about. Let's start by talking about Roosevelt and LaGuardia. Two more outwardly dissimilar people one could hardly imagine, right? Roosevelt, the jaunty, smiling scion of Hudson Valley landed gentry. LaGuardia, the sweaty, scowling, profane son of immigrants. Smiling in this picture, often he was scowling. LaGuardia later referred to the pair as, quote, the son of the revolution and the son of the steerage. They were born in the same year, 1882, 11 months, about 90 miles apart, a proximity in time and space that belies the very different worlds from which they sprang. Roosevelt grew up in a quasi-aristocratic setting in Hyde Park, New York, just uh, north of Poughkeepsie. LaGuardia, the son of an Italian father and Sephardic mother, was born in Greenwich Village on what's now Sullivan Street though he grew up in the Arizona Territory, in Prescott, where his father, who was an army band leader, was stationed. Roosevelt became a Democrat. He served in the New York State Senate, then became Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Woodrow Wilson. In 1920, was the Democrat's vice presidential candidate. Of course, after that, disaster struck. In 1921, he contracted polio and lost the use of his legs. He survived in politics, in large measure by making an alliance with the Irish Catholic Demo uh, Democratic politicos in New York City who he'd previously scorned. Above all, Governor Al Smith, the phenomenally popular governor uh, of the 1920s, makes his way back into politics in 1928 when Smith, who was, run who was running for president, uh, asked FDR to run for governor of New York to help shore up his own chances of election. There was no real precedent for a person in Roosevelt's uh, physical condition to, to take a position that high in public life, but um, FDR in some ways thought the rules you know, never quite applied to him, or at least didn't accept what, uh, what the rules were supposed to be in some ways. Um, it's part of his temperament that uh, enabled a, a, a landmark presidency. Um, he went to sleep that night here in the city um, on, on 65th Street, uh, believing he'd lost. It was a very close election. Of course, he ended up winning. Smith lost in a landslide, but two years later, FDR ran for re-election as governor, won overwhelmingly, and this put him on the fast track to the Democratic nomination for president in 1932. And we know what happened after that. LaGuardia became a Republican because he grew up in the West, I think, primarily. He always thought of himself as a Westerner, took his political cues from Western progressives like Senator La Follette um, of Wisconsin, George Norris of uh, Nebraska, men he looked up to as mentors when he became a congressman himself in the 1920s. Uh, LaGuardia, after spending some time in Europe in the consulate, uh, moved to New York in his mid-20s. It was only really then that he became a New Yorker. He learned to be a New Yorker. I think this is goes some way to explaining why he was able to sort of feel his way into many different parts of the city, is that he wasn't native to any one of them. Um, he joined a local Republican club. He was a Republican partisan at the beginning of his career. He was not to the reform uh, manner born. Uh, soon won its nomination to Congress, which he joined in 1917. He left in spectacular fashion uh, to join the Army and became an airman. Uh, which was uh, still a very sort of novel, daring thing in the First World War. Uh, and this brought him some measure of renown. Uh, he left the Congress uh, after coming back from military service, rejoined briefly, left in 1920 to serve as president of New York City's Board of Aldermen. This is where he first acquired a knowledge of municipal government and local politics, of where the levers of power are, what you need to do to pull them. Um, he served in that capacity for only two years, the second of which was extraordinarily uh, unhappy for him, before returning to Congress in 1923, where he would remain until the early 30s. After the onset of the Great Depression, LaGuardia became a leading proponent of unemployment insurance, a federal public works program, uh, a federal relief program, government insurance of bank deposits. In other words, he spent the last couple years in Congress of his congressional career fighting for programs that would be enacted under FDR's New Deal, 
which is one reason why he felt later as mayor an allegiance to FDR. But in 1932, a bunch of new voters in uh, LaGuardia's East Harlem Congressional District went to the polls to vote for the Democrats. Um, LaGuardia hadn't really had a chance to integrate them into his own political coalition. They voted in FDR and they voted out LaGuardia. So on the very day that Roosevelt delivered his famous Nothing to Fear But Fear It speech inaugural, March 4th, 1933, LaGuardia left Washington um, regretting the chance that he would not have uh, regretting the fact that he would not have a chance to work uh, for Roosevelt, with Roosevelt, uh, as a member of the House, and came back to New York. Right away, almost right away, uh, he started plotting uh, for how he could get into City Hall. Roosevelt, by that time, had presided over an almost two-year-long investigation into corruption in New York City politics, an expose of the Tammany Hall regime. This was headed by a former judge named Samuel Seabury, and it uncovered all kinds of truly spectacular instances of graft and influence peddling, indefensible appointments, franchises let to companies that aren't going to be able to fulfill them, and these sorts of things, all of which culminated in September 1932 when Roosevelt, in the midst of his presidential campaign, is still considering what to do about Jimmy Walker. Does he have the power to remove him? Ought he to remove him? Walker makes things easy on him and takes off for England uh, with his mistress. Um, so Walker is out. Tammany is in disgrace. And LaGuardia is, uh, sees this as an opportunity. By the end of the summer of 1933, he had secured the Republican nomination had the support of a large group of civic organizations united in opposition to Tammany. Roosevelt actually tried to defeat him in the fall 1933 election. Um, this has been a matter of speculation, but if, if you look closely at, uh, at uh, Jim Farley's diary and some other things, it's clear that um, Roosevelt and the Democrats who were sort of his head politicos in New York realized LaGuardia would win in a two-person election with the Tammany candidate. They inject their own independent pro-New Deal Democrat trying to recreate the Democratic Party in New York. Um, LaGuardia wins anyway. This ends up splitting the Democratic vote. Um, LaGuardia would have won. LaGuardia won anyway with a 40% plurality. And on New Year's Day, 1934, becomes mayor of New York. He chases the Tammany crowd out, replaces them with experts and professionals, opens up the civil service to a wider swath of New York society, reorganizes the departments so they would function more efficiently. He started conducting surprise visits to city agencies, chased fire engines to three alarm fires. As soon as the courts permitted him, he confiscated slot machines, loaded them on barges, and sunk them in the Long Island Sound. He made sure the newsreel cameras were rolling when he did it. All of this furious activity reminds a lot of people of Roosevelt's 100 Days the year before. Um, throughout this period, you see headlines in newspapers that say New York's own New Deal. Um, editorial cartoons, too. This means vigorous action after a period where government seemed impotent. This is the moment where one starts to see an association in the public mind between Roosevelt and LaGuardia. Any hard feelings LaGuardia might have harbored toward Roosevelt as a consequence of the 1933 campaign were quickly forgotten. By the summer of 1935, Roosevelt and LaGuardia were considered such close political allies uh, that one Brooklyn political columnist wrote that LaGuardia had, quote, a confidential relationship with Mr. Roosevelt enjoyed by no Democrat. The doors of the White House open at his radiant approach the president is never too busy to sit down and have a chat with him. This is, our, this is the first puzzle for this talk. Why such a close relationship between such different people, between figures of different uh, politicians from different political uh, parties? A few reasons. One is that Roosevelt and LaGuardia liked each other personally. They were both jokesters and gregarious types. Um, they enjoyed each other's company. They also admired each other. LaGuardia, as I'd mentioned earlier, thought Roosevelt's political leadership made possible the enactment of a lot of things that he'd been working for all through the 20s, and especially after the Great Crash. 
Um, for his part, Roosevelt um, was said to have described LaGuardia as the nation's, quote, number one cutter of red tape. And on one occasion, this was the dedication of a, uh, a building at Greenpoint Hospital in Brooklyn, pulled a Democratic ward boss aside and said, I think LaGuardia is, quote, a great man. Said this to one of his own Democratic uh, politicos. They also shared unmistakably similar ideas about what we nowadays call the role of government. Uh, both grew up during an age of great sort of technological improvement. They believed society could be improved through concerted human action that advances in technology and engineering and medicine had opened the door to unprecedented social progress. Um, and they both thought that it was the task of government to help America channel these uh, energies and, and new technologies uh, in order to produce social progress. They both thought about government's role in all of this. They thought about government not as a special entity whose relation to the rest of society had to be tightly cordoned, uh, but rather as an extension of the community, one part of the community, one instrument of social cooperation whose activities would be dictated not by um, you know, formal uh, structures necessarily, uh, but by the needs of society and the will of the people. For this reason, they believed the role of government was something that ought to change, that the functions of government would evolve as society developed and new impediments to the health and happiness of people arose. But most of all, they discovered that they could use each other to mutual advantage. Theirs was a business partnership, one member of LaGuardia's administration said. They discovered they could use each other to mutual advantage and to understand why in some ways is to get to the very heart of political history in New Deal New York. In 1933, in March, when Roosevelt came into office, his primary problem was a general economic collapse. By the summer of 1934, the end of the summer in particular, it was no longer a general economic crisis but rather unemployment, which is a more specific sort of problem. In fact, real GDP had recovered very quickly. Growth rates uh, in that uh, respect would be um, higher during the peak years of war mobilization in the 1940s. At no other time since 1934, 35, 36 has the American economy grown as quickly in output terms as it did then. So, Factories are producing more stuff. They're, they're taking advantage of this unemployment situation to hire the most productive workers and then make them very productive. Uh, all of which uh, produces what we nowadays call a jobless recovery. So the pro which is a term, incidentally, which comes out of the 1930s. Um, so it's jobs. It's no longer a general economic crisis, although the economy is not perfect. Jobs. How is Roosevelt going to meet this problem? First thing, first thing is he defined the problem as one of jobs. The sort of most plausible counterfactual here is that you just give pure and simple relief payments to people who are out of work until the labor market adjusts somehow and they get work again. But that doesn't give people jobs. Roosevelt wanted to give people jobs. I talk in the book about some of the alternative approaches he might have taken, but the one he adopts is to put people to work on local projects designed, carried out, largely supervised by city and county governments. This becomes the driving idea behind the Works Progress Administration, the largest in budgetary terms, in the near term at least, most important uh, politically uh, agency of the New Deal. By the summer of 1935, Roosevelt had received from Congress immense discretion to spend $4.88 billion, the largest single peacetime appropriation to that point in American history, on public works projects meant to create short-term government jobs where the unemployed were living. <coughs> Roosevelt allocated some of that money to an agency that already existed, the Public Works Administration, um, which came out of this 1933 100 days moment. That agency, the PWA, provided grants and aid to local governments uh, for public works projects. So the, 
government, uh, say New York City or the Port Authority would send in an application, the federal government would say, okay, we're going to fund this, and they'd give back 30% of the cost of the thing, later 45% of the cost of the thing. Um, the Works Progress Administration, Administration, which got the bulk of this money, operated a bit differently. The city certified certain people who applied as being in need of relief. Then they submitted proposals to the federal government uh, asking for these unemployed people who are certified as a need to be able to work on local projects. Um, so paid by the federal government, uh, put to work by local governments. The PWA and the WPA, I'm going to conflate them a bit more from this point forward in the talk, but the, and the reason why is this. They both channeled productive resources, capital in the Public Works Administration's case, labor in the WPA's case, into city and county governments and public authorities like the Port Authority. Until the coming of the Second World War, the federal government committed about a quarter of its annual expenditure to public investment via these two agencies, about 2.3% of GDP. Uh, to give you, for comparison's sake, this is uh, about half of what the US government was spending on military functions before the sequester. So this is a lot of money we're talking about here, going into city governments. And what they do is allow local officials to undertake more creative programs than fiscal and personnel constraints would otherwise have allowed. Particularly in the 1930s, uh, because what happens to city governments when there are major national economic crises? You get the 1970s. You get um, austerity and disinvestment. And in fact, that's what it looked like to a lot of people LaGuardia's administration would consist of at the time he was elected. Um, as the, uh, the great socialist standard bearer Norman Thomas uh, forecast in the fall of 1933, the mayor of New York could be, quote, scarcely more than a receiver in bankruptcy under a broken down political and economic system. Most signs before the onset of these New Deal programs were that LaGuardia would preside over an era of austerity and disinvestment. But there was a New Deal. It erased this condition of municipal austerity. Not entirely, there was always a whiff of frugality about the LaGuardia administration. Uh, he was very deeply committed to balanced budgets in some ways. Um, but for much of LaGuardia's first two terms, the municipal departments in the city enjoyed a gift of manpower and money, which in many instances doubled the labor at their command. Let me, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past this slide very quickly. This is, I'm making a simple-minded but very important point here. Um, we're talking about New York City's creative economy as part of this uh, series at CUNY. There were a lot of creative workers in New York, a lot more than in the nation uh, at large. And consequently, you know, not all of them become unemployed, but the, the jobless crisis, joblessness crisis sweeps through New York's economy. And a lot of trained nurses and librarians, musicians, artists, sculptors, people in the building trades do become eligible for the Works Progress Administration. So the point here is that there's a lot more you can do uh, with these workers if they're trained in things that are useful, that make them productive uh, for working on public projects. The WPA in this case, in this sense, is a profoundly pro-urban program because it is designed in such a way that makes it operate most effectively in urban areas. One more thing I want to impress upon you uh, before we're going to use PowerPoint here to take a little tour of some of what the uh, New Deal did in New York. Uh, but, but I want to impress upon you the scale of this um, infusion of resources. So in the mid-1930s, when, when the WPA is going at sort of peak uh, capacity, it is allocating to Robert Moses's Parks Department more than 800% above what the city itself is appropriating for parks. All right, so some of you will have read The Power Broker. You'll know that a lot of, not a, well, Moses acquires during these years a reputation as a charismatic bureaucrat who's capable of doing things that are otherwise impossible. That's why we have to keep appointing him to do things, because he seems singularly capable of doing things that are impossible for other administrators. I submit right now that you can't understand this phase of Moses' career unless you understand that he was working with resources 800% above what a normal parks commissioner of New York would enjoy, right? Um, 
Now, this is not the most efficient source of labor. Moses himself estimates it's probably about 50% as efficient as if he had gone out and hired uh, people on contract or as civil service employees. But even still, that leaves 400% above what the city was. So this is the scale of the thing. And you'll see what I'm arguing when I say that this kind of obliterates the structural constraints that were in place on uh, New York's uh, agencies. So let's take a little tour here. This is the Triborough Bridge. I've sort of classed these projects into three types. This is type number one, is what we nowadays call mega projects. Um, really large transportation infrastructure projects which are meant to link the, the boroughs together, uh, to link the political city, which has just been created at the turn of the century, to the region um, beyond that. And uh, in one instance, which is coming up in a moment, uh, to link New York City to the rest of the nation and to the continent of Europe. Um, so there's a big sort of capital lift that has to go on to connect, to create an automotive uh, infrastructure in New York, because New York is where it is uh, because it was built during the age of the sale, right? You've got to cross rivers and uh, go under them and so forth. So you have the Triborough Bridge, you have the... Um, Queens and Lincoln, uh, Queens Midtown and Lincoln Tunnels, the West Side Highway, the East River Drive, the Belt Parkway, all projects of this sort built for uh, autos. This is LaGuardia Airport, which is the largest single WPA project anywhere in the nation, uh, another project of this sort. The second category encompasses smaller scale construction projects that create an infrastructure within which the city's own services could be expanded. Um, the New Deal is helping to capitalize new municipal services. So the 1910s and 1920s are, are an era where New York's uh, outer boroughs are really populated in their modern uh, form. One of the things that the, this is not in the outer boroughs, but one of the things that uh, the city does in response is um, to create uh, college campuses out there to extend its sort of unique system of public higher education. The New Deal helped build the campus of Brooklyn College, uh, the Bronx campus of Hunter College, which is now where Lehman Honors College is, and they built in Manhattan too. This is Hunter, uh, an administrative building at Hunter College um, in Midtown East. Um, another example of this is New York's District Health Center uh, program, which is meant to bring the Department of Health into communities so they can take advantage of local knowledge built in unions, churches, and other places. This is particularly important in the 30s for responding quickly to the outbreak of communicable disease. Um, another example would be the facilities the New Deal built for WNYC, which probably would have died in the mid-30s had it not been for the New Deal. Another project of this sort is public housing. Um, I'll skate over this pretty quickly, but uh, the, the point is just that the New Deal helped launch the New York City Housing Authority helped establish it on its own two feet, really. Um, this project was uh, the Williamsburg Houses is a collaboration between the newly born New York City Housing Authority and uh, the Public Works Administration. It's a, a view of the courtyard there. The Harlem River Houses in, uh, in Harlem, also a PWA project. Third category is, um, which I suppose overlaps some with the second, is public space. Um, this is the period where automotive traffic is coming to dominate the city's streets, um, with active government support, by the way. Um, but the New Deal Works agencies are helping New York's local officials carve out new facilities, discrete facilities for rest, play, and social interaction. City uh, parks acreage increased by 24% during this period. Restoration projects improved the quality of many existing public spaces. This is Central Park Zoo which was restored, uh, remade really by New Deal workers. The zoos in Prospect Park and uh, Barrett Park on Staten Island were built by the New Deal and the Parks Department. Swimming pool in Red Hook. Um, there are a lot of these still being used very uh, widely around the city. Let me, uh, in time remaining, shift a bit and talk about the politics of how all this uh, worked. Not how it went for Roosevelt and LaGuardia so much, but what New Yorkers themselves thought about it. So all these, all these structures, all these sort of um, you know, amenities, they come with a story. Uh, they come from the New Deal with a story. The New Dealers maintain that the American people were essentially virtuous, that American society and its component parts were basically sound. 
One reason, I think, incidentally, that, uh, that they were so reluctant to intervene and establish social practices such as racism here in the city and everywhere else in this country, Williamsburg Houses, which I just showed you, was a segregated facility. Um, it's one of the reasons they had to build Harlem River Houses. Um, but the New Dealers thought that individuals, families were basically sound, but had been submerged by conditions more or less outside their control. Mostly involved deprivation of access or opportunity. So the moral satisfaction and um, the livelihood provided by work, to adequate housing and recreation, to decent health facilities, uh, and so forth. Because private industry had not shown itself capable of doing so, it fell to government to remove these constraints. That's the sort of ideological basis for providing these, uh, these policies and programs and goods and services. In the 1930s context, there's a sort of um, uh, American is, uh, comparative element to all of this. Um, it's, this story is inscribed in a narrative of national difference. The WPA was the American way of meeting the Great Depression. American public investment, community building, stood in opposition to the British dole, or direct relief for people who needed it, and German military production. This is the American way. What did New Yorkers themselves think of all of this? The WPA itself was a highly controversial agency. This is a sort of manifestation of this famous disjuncture in American life between uh, operationally liberal and ideologically conservative. Um, people, uh, sometimes said that they didn't like the way all this money was being spent. But on the local level, the products of WPA labor were very, very popular. About 1.4 million New Yorkers pushed through the turnstiles of the WPA built swimming pools the first summer they were open, 1936. Orchard and Jacob Reese beaches registered nearly 4 million admissions during the following summer. When LaGuardia and Moses opened local parks and playgrounds, entire communities turned out. These became uh, civic pageants, really. Um, when LaGuardia Airport was opened, uh, 325,000 people attended the opening of it. Um, and it became, you know, most working class and even middle class New Yorkers won't, weren't flying out of LaGuardia during these years. It's only in the post-war decades that this becomes accessible uh, flight. But, they are going out there to watch the planes land. Um, this becomes one of the most popular attractions in New York, actually. I forget if it was a nickel or a dime, but you paid it and you got to go. And, and sort of credit for being able to do things accrued to the, to the city government as a consequence. There's an additional cultural dimension to all of this. Um, social provision turns on power, but also imagination. As the political scientist E.E. E. Schottschneider has written, what people do about the government depends on what they think the government is able to do. A maxim that in this case applies to ordinary citizens just as well as it does to the people in the halls of power. Much of what LaGuardia's government did in the 1930s had been on urban reform agendas since the early years of the 20th century, if not before. But one observes a noticeable increase in mass popular support for this conception of government, the elements of which it consisted, once the New Deal, with its dramatic demonstrations of state competency, actually shows these things to be attainable. So the New Deal makes possible a new standard of municipal government, but it also helps catalyze a rapid and far-reaching change in popular expectations for public sector production. In short, and very simply, New Yorkers, and people elsewhere for that matter, uh, came to see the government as a potentially valuable resource as they went about building their own lives and communities. Because they thought government could help them and could imagine circumstances under which it would help them, they became more involved in the city's political life, exercising a more robust form of democratic citizenship. Among other things, this helps pull hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers into the electorate in the city. The number of people who vote in mayoral elections between the last pre-depression election, 1929, the first real post-war election in 1949, uh, grows by more than 80%, which is, expands the coalition building's uh, arithmetic in the city, but 
It also brings into politics a lot of people whose expectations uh, and views of expectations for and views about government are formed during this period. On to uh, the end game here. WPA spending was ramped up twice. Once in the second half of 1935, as the programs were being mobilized. Again in 1938, in response to the Roosevelt recession. At practically all other points, it was subject to strong pressures for economization emanating from the White House, actually. Uh, Roosevelt always wanted to show the American people that he was responsible in budgetary terms. Um, but especially from a congressional coalition which after 1936 or so joined Republicans uh, with powerful Southern Democrats. New York's municipal government responded to these cutbacks by assuming financial responsibility for projects that had begun as joint federal municipal collaborations. For instance, uh, the WPA's announcement in June of 1937 that it would terminate 34,000 jobs in New York City was met by an announcement from the city that almost 4,000 WPA workers would receive permanent positions as soon as they could pass the civil service exams. This, this is a process of incorpora uh, uh, incorporation uh, of federal municipal projects uh, into purely municipal functions. And as the WPA uh, is cut back, this produces higher municipal spending in areas where the WPA had been particularly active. Recreation, public health, hospitalization. Spending in some of these areas grew by 50% or more uh, between 1936, uh, when the WPA was at its peak in 1939, 1940, by which time it was being scaled back. Soon, LaGuardia and the Board of Estimate would themselves pull back sharply on municipal spending in order to preserve resources for the war effort, but already evident was a pattern which would characterize the post-war era as the New Deal public investment state withered at the local level, withered at the national level, uh, its initiatives were picked up at the local level by the city. So the WPA itself was liquidated in 1943, the casualty of full employment and also the Republican congressional resurgence of 1942. This marked the end of the intergovernmental public investment state of the 1930s. Direct federal municipal relations of the sort pioneered in the 30s uh, would endure. Co-functionality across the federal system would remain a basic feature of American governance. But before the renaissance of federal urban policy in the 1960s, and also notwithstanding a, a few targeted grant and aid programs, and urban renewal, which in some ways I see as the exception that proves the rule, um, Notwithstanding these instances, the national government would largely withdraw its fiscal resources from local governments. At the peak of the New Deal, federal spending on projects sponsored by New York's municipal departments had totaled more than 30% above the city's annual budget. In the post-war decade, that figure fell dramatically. As late as fiscal year 1965-66, federal contributions would make up uh, only 6.8% of the city's yearly expenditures. And yet, and yet, even as the alphabet agencies of the 1930s faded into memory, New York's local New Deal would seem to continue. The municipal government doing on its own, and increasingly with the aid of New York State, what it had previously done in collaboration with the federal government. With the end of the New Deal works programs, local social provision would become a question of extraction as well as allocation. They've got to raise taxes to produce this revenue, but they're able to do it because the city is booming and the uh, in the 50s and especially the 60s, it's doing much better than the other, most of the other cities in the Northeast and Midwest during this period. Um, so New York's municipal uh, government would never again possess the sheer manpower the New Deal had given it, yet the political forces spawned in the 1930s would prove capable of sustaining a robust local social politics, which stood apart in the American experience increasingly once this becomes purely a local uh, the question, New York only then goes in a different direction in a lot of ways from other cities in America, would sustain a robust local social politics which came to symbolize in the historian Joshua Freeman's words, the best or worst of urban liberalism depending on one's point of view. I'll leave it there and I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Not forget about this. Isn't it? 
Okay. Uh, soon uh, we will turn the floor over to you folks for questions and uh, comments, but as I find myself in possession of the microphone, uh, I'm going to seize on the opportunity and maybe toss out a couple of questions to get us rolling. Um, Mason says in his book, uh, and I think he delivers on this, that although this is uh, focused on FDR and LaGuardia, this is not a revival of the great man theory of history. Oh, uh, and in fact, it's a very complex and nuanced uh, affair that takes uh, uh, cognizance of a variety of social and political forces. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about one particular uh, thing, which, you know, like mo all the important things, makes an appearance in there. But I'm uh, wondering, it's not that I have an answer secretly up my sleeve here, um, but I'm wondering about the role of the left. Uh, and in particular, I'm wondering about the uh, degree to which it's fair to say that the uh, massive demonstrations organized in New York City, in Union Square most famously in 1930, but a variety of them, as well as demonstrations by the unemployed around the city, uh, by rent uh, strikes, by uh, anti-eviction uh, protests, sent political tremors through the official political system in a way perhaps not commensurate with the reality. This was not a revolutionary moment, although they didn't know that then. Um, and the, the question is the degree to which the uh, alarm generated by the fact that a potential serious massive critique, rejection, or massive transformation of the capitalist order itself uh, had been put on the table uh, and that there were bodies, in fact, who were put in the streets behind this. To what extent was the existence of that kind of activist left a um, an ingredient in the mix of things uh, that led to the emergence of the New Deal? It's a very important part. Um, let's back up even before the 1930s. Bear in mind that the, the idea that in times of economic distress, government had some responsibility to help people meet their private obligations or um, or social obligations for that matter, by providing them work was an idea of popular province. Um, as Mike's book Gotham shows, uh, you know, every time there's a, a general crisis of the capitalist economy, uh, in the 19th century, workers uh, march on in the streets or on city hall demanding bread or work. And march on Wall Street too. March on Wall Street too. Um, so I think one of the reasons why that policy response uh, is there as a measure of last resort, actually, you know, bear in mind I'm saying this gets enacted because other measures have failed, uh, is because working people have put it there. Um, now, in the 30s uh, proper, yes, yes, absolutely uh, uh, active uh, protest by social movements, by protesters, uh, is very important. Among other things, in the fall of 1934, that critical moment I was talking about, um, this has been, uh, leading up to this is sort of three months of organized demonstrations of the unemployed demanding jobs. Um, they march in and see LaGuardia. There's a sort of pitched battle between protesters and police in front of the, um, I think the welfare department's building. All of which is just to say, I, I don't really see these, this response from Roosevelt as sort of one aimed to head off pending social uh, revolution or something like that. Uh, it's not that kind of response, yet you have to appreciate that uh, popular uprisings played a very important role in keeping this issue at the forefront of American politics. It's something the president has to respond to because they're expressing what he recognizes as legitimate demands and they're speaking for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that uh, there and elsewhere, very important part of the story. Okay, second of three, um, a New York City-ish question. Is it legitimate to say, as I've been known to do, that one can argue that the New Deal was made in New York City? Uh, by that I mean not just that Roosevelt brought down several famous players, Francis Perkins, Harry Hopkins, Eleanor, and, and, and in fact it's an enormous list of people, uh, social workers, uh, uh, politicians, uh, political activists, 
uh, businessmen as well, of an interesting uh, dimension, including Goldman Sachs players. Uh, and, I mean, sometimes, perhaps getting carried away, I like to say that what happened in the 30s was that, the, that New York goes to Washington, boards and seizes the federal government and remakes it in the image of New York putting into practice a variety of programs, social security, unemployment, insurance, blah, 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 public works, uh, that have in fact been uh, conceived in the social policy complex of New York that have been backed over time by powerful economic and political forces uh, uh, and uh, are now transferred successfully, not through just personnel, but through conceptual uh, uh, programs. Uh, and that, in fact, all this comes to an end in '38 when forces from the South and the West are capable of mobilizing to sort of block further expansion of this enterprise. Made in New York? In, in not, to, not to slur, you know, Wisconsin and <laughs> Harvard and all that. I mean, there's obviously a variety of players in this, and you don't put together a political coalition composed only of the congressional delegation of uh, New York City. The, uh, the way I think about that element of it is, first off, you have to understand how it was that, you know, so even during Roosevelt's first term, Southern congressmen were veto actors, right? So you have to understand what, how you're able to get an alliance of, of South Carolina and Mississippi and New York um, during the most active years of the New Deal. Um, and it has to do, I think, primarily with the sort of strategic uses of the federal structure. Um, but nevertheless, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I would generalize it a little bit. I think that mostly what you see is the states and the cities going to Washington. Um, so, you know, unemployment insurance and old age pensions, a lot of that's in Wisconsin and Ohio have been laboratories for that sort of thing. Work relief starts in New York, right? Um, under Franklin D. Roosevelt, governor. Um, so I think the general pattern is one of nationalization of sort of very robust uh, governmental experiments and programs that have been going on since the progressive era in cities especially, uh, and also states, with New York, which has been the most active in a lot of ways, playing a particularly important role. Okay, third, last, um, implications for the present. <laughs> I mean, the New Deal got squelched. One has to analyze, you know, why. Uh, and we have to talk about racism and the role of the switchover, in mm -hmm. fact, of Southern congressmen now terrified that, in fact, this is, although, in fact, Roosevelt had been very cautious precisely to keep Carolina uh, votes in the Senate uh, on racial matters and exempted all kinds of uh, programs from African-American participation. And he wasn't, you know, the programs were problematic for women uh, as well. Um, but uh, that and the Cold War uh, in general, I mean, you run your argument appropriately down to 1948, uh, a critical turning point in all of this. Uh, you talk correctly about the, uh, on the one hand, I mean, LaGuardia understood, and Moses at his side, that there was no way on earth that the vast panoply of post-war projects that he had in mind that would be continuing basically the New Deal would be possible without federal funding. 75% um, for, uh, for project design, 50% for construction of projects, uh, and indeed, uh, as Mason notes, that LaGuardia went to his grave worried, not incorrectly, that the political impetus that made that kind of federal to city and state transfer uh, not uh, very likely. Um, in a sense, one can argue that Kennedy, a little squeaky bit, Johnson to a considerable extent, uh, who in fact was a New Deal veteran, uh, are attempts to in fact push back against the, the, that direction of history that was the Cold War 40s and 50s. Uh, and that had some appeals in the crisis of the mid-70s, in fact, 
the fiscal crisis of New York being a critical battleground in this, where many of the remaining accomplishments that had been won during the New Deal were in fact reversed in the city level. Reagan takes that program to a national level, uh, and we have the 80s, uh, and we have then the Gingrichian uh, 90s, which is in a full-scale attempt to roll back what's left of the New Deal. You can see, I think, a great deal of post-war history as struggles over continuing uh, or reversing uh, the New Deal. Uh, there are always uh, people who keep reminding us of the memories of this, and, and this is one of the reasons that Mason's book is so important. Uh, in 2002, I came out with a little book called A New Deal for New York, uh, which seemed to be an early sign of a little boomlet in this new New Deal uh, moment. Um, with Obama, there was this sense of the possibilities of all of this, uh, which I think, a uh, very big and complicated story, have not in fact come to fruition, uh, partly through fault of his own, partly through the same crowd, arguably, which has stymied the New Deal uh, since the, the late 1930s. Uh, which brings us down to now. Uh, you know, people can put on the table, we need to redirect investment from the private sector to the public sector, we need public works programs, we need job creation, we need all kinds of things that are the legacy of the New Deal. But what are the political prospects for this? Uh, uh, given, A, the uh, in tremendous measure demise of the labor movement, which whose growth was an outcome and then a facilitator of the New Deal itself, and the mm, not banished left, uh, Occupy Wall Street, I think was in the mode, that series of modes that in New York in particular responded to the crisis of hard times by calling for assaults on uh, uh, the resulting inequality and unemployment uh, and the rest of it. Uh, but there isn't, in fact, going back to my first question, a, uh, a strong or at least sufficiently scary uh, uh, left that has sufficient plausibility with the general public to be a political force that might enable a breakthrough in this logjam that's been going on for the last 50 years. So given that you're on top of the political analysis of the er moment in all of this, what do you think about where we're at now and where we go from here? Well, um, <laughs> uh, relatively little is going to come to New York from Washington uh, for the foreseeable future. There's one actually very big and important exception to that, which is uh, the Affordable Care Act which is going to uh, get implemented by whoever the next mayor is, um, which provides a real opportunity in a lot of ways for uh, innovative municipal level uh, health projects. Um, let me, uh, instead of telling you all what to think about this, tell you where I think we are in terms of the long legacy of the New Deal. I argued um, at the end of that talk that uh, New York City does on its own and with help from New York State uh, what it had been doing in collaboration with the federal government during the New Deal in the post-war era. There's, uh, as Mike points out, a renaissance of federal urban policy under Johnson that keeps going, although it gets transmuted in the Nixon years up until Carter and Reagan. And then there's a what seems so far to be a permanent withdrawal of uh, federal government resources from America's uh, cities especially in the context of the urban crisis of the 70s, the fiscal crisis and the sort of broader uh, shock of that decade, people who regarded themselves as, maybe they wouldn't have called themselves New Deal liberals, but a person like Koch is, was unstinting in his admiration for LaGuardia, uh, saw himself as a follower uh, of LaGuardia's in many ways. They begin thinking in ways that LaGuardia never would have about definite limits of uh, public ambition. Um, and start in the 80s especially trying to devise new ways of making collective investments. Uh, and this continues. You see somebody like Bloomberg will talk about the 70s and say it was a big mistake, all the disinvestment we did in the 70s. But on the other hand, you can't really frighten business the way that you seem to have in the 70s, so what are you going to do? Um, one of the things you can do is enlist uh, private 
partners um, to help provide public or quasi-public goods. And, um, and you can get some really remarkable things, like the High Line and Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, the problem there, and I, I'm, I'm not about to start hating on the High Line, it's a really tremendous facility which has enriched New York uh, greatly, but it's built in a place where a lot of wealthy people who were trying to attract to the city are vested, right? Um, Michael Powell of the Times had uh, some measure of the number of gardeners employed in the High Line versus the number of maintenance employees in um, um, Pelham Bay Park, right? Uh -huh. Take a look. Um, so that's where we are now, is it's way better than it was when there was this sort of general crisis of public investment. On the other hand, we have to think about ways to make uh, this renewal of public investment in a lot of ways work for everybody. Um, and I think thinking about how what government can do on the community level, um, as the New Dealers did, on the neighborhood level, um, is a good place to start, yeah. Okay, now, floor is yours. Uh, ground rules uh, are please come to one of the other of these microphones. I know this is a discriminatory against center people, um, but we'll have to see how far we get. Uh, and if we run out of side people, then we can have people bellow from the, uh, from the center. Uh, and just an advance notice that uh, pumpkin uh, time is 8 o'clock, at which point books will be available for sale just outside that door, and unless I miss my guess, Mason will be available not for sale, but for signature uh, uh, scribbling uh, in the inside of your uh, newly purchased uh, volume. So, I will... Uh, try to uh, bounce back and forth between microphones, starting on the left, my left. What were the criteria that was used um, in creating some of the projects during the WPA um, in the Depression? The, the, pro, the um, bulk of the effort seems to have been on um, projects that did not involve mass transit, it does not seem to have been an investment in interurban and uh, subway construction in the city at the, where the priority seems to have gone into highways. Was there some rational uh, policy consideration that isn't, isn't visible, at least not to my eye? I, I think there was an unspoken uh, policy, at least if somebody spoke it explicitly, I, have, I didn't come across it. Uh, and I think it was this. Um, the independent system, the lines with letters, uh, had been built in the 20s. Um, before that, you had the dual uh, contracts and the, the IRT and BMT system. So I think that the rationale in the 30s was we have the world's best uh, rail rapid transit infrastructure in the city. A lot of it is new. We just built it last decade. You know what we definitely don't have in the city is a, uh, is a, a reasonable uh, automotive transportation network. Now, I, you know, I should mention also that some Public Works Administration money did go toward extending the 8th Avenue line. Uh, independent financing helped build the, um, the 6th Avenue trunk line. So we do get some, and there are extensions in the suburbs, but uh, not the outer boroughs. <laughs> this, this is a, a, actually a real problem with my book, I think, is the Manhattan-centric focus of it. Um, hopefully not too big a problem. but. Um, that's, that's the reasoning, I think, uh, is that, look, it's easy to look back on it now and say we, it, was, it was a missed opportunity uh, to improve the subway system, and, and that's, I'm certainly not saying that's wrong, but I think that was the reason why. Sure. Uh, you said that in 1930... Back off a bit from the mic. You're... You said that in 1933, FDR and the White House tried to defeat LaGuardia. Did they back... O'Brien, the Democratic, or McKee, did they back, back McKee? Joseph uh, McKee? Yes, yes. Um, O'Brien was the Tammany candidate who was put, uh, this was apparently never raised with Farley or Flynn or any of the, the, the New Deal Democrats. 
um, but was put into the race, uh, it was the incumbent actually, so I guess that's why he was in the race. He wasn't taken out of the race because Tammany wanted to assert its own sort of authority in the face of, um, of Roosevelt and his people who were clearly beginning the process of taking over the Democratic Party uh, in the city. The, what happened was there was a, a poll taken and it became clear LaGuardia was going to win. So Farley and Flynn took to the White House the idea of putting a very popular uh, interim mayor, Joseph McKee, into the race as an, you know, an all but official New Deal Democratic candidate. Um, Roosevelt actually helped draft Farley's speech uh, saying that uh, we're going to do this. He apparently pledged to Flynn that uh, he would make an open endorsement of McKee. Uh, he backed off of that uh, for reasons that are outlined in the book. But, um, but yeah, he was, behind, uh, he was behind McKee, helped choose some of McKee's running mates and persuade them to run. Um, he had this idea of creating a new pro-New Deal reform democracy in New York City. And in 1937, he actually tried to talk Senator Wagner into running for mayor of New York even though he was already uh, collaborating very actively with LaGuardia. It just goes to show you how important the party was to him here in New York City. Sir. Thank you. A comment and a question. The comment is I want to thank you for raising the question of the general upsurge of community organizing, the labor unions, and so on, which was so important in giving Roosevelt and, and LaGuardia a base for the action they were doing, for the steps they were taking, because without this, this kind of demonstrative su support, it might have been much more difficult to persuade the politicians to go along with it because they recognized the unrest that was appearing that was so prevalent at that time. The question is this, how was all this funded? Did the raise taxes? Did the government issue bonds? Did the banks give money? And uh, was Keynes' problem, was Keynes' uh, principles followed? Uh, because all this may be relevant to what the trouble we're having now with the stimulus and so on. Was there mass inflation? Be I don't think there was, but was there inflation at the time when all, of, all this money was being spent? It's hard to, hard to understand that, so I appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, um, uh, deficit financing at the federal level. At the city level, uh, what's important vis-a-vis -vis the WPA is they don't have to pay for too much of it, right? So it's a question of allocating resources that are coming in from somewhere else. It makes it a lot easier uh, on local politicians to spend that money. Um, and it's important that by the time the city has to start raising taxes to pay for that stuff itself, which it does through the sales tax and raising property taxes, um, these programs are already starting to show results and are very popular among a lot of New Yorkers. And, and the sort of bureaucracy has developed. You know, Moses is there and has built his uh, wheels within wheels. Um, uh, well, the second part of the question was about inflation. Uh, it isn't a problem in the 1930s just because it's, there's a general economic crisis. It's a period of deflation, which is the problem initially. It was Dur deflation, yeah. During the, um, during the uh, very early years of the war effort, 40, 41, 42, into 43, inflation is a terrible problem. Because the government's spending so much to produce full production for the war effort, um, which this becomes the, the subject of chapter nine of the book, which is all about how um, anti-inflation programs at the national level helped create things like rent control here in the city. Isn't it the case that there's an interesting irony in terms of funding mechanisms that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which had been set up by Hoover to give aid to distressed banks, uh, this may have a slightly familiar ring to it. Uh, Millionaire is dull, LaGuardia called it. Uh, yes, LaGuardia was enraged at the uh, dole for gazillionaires um, and, and corporations uh, as well becomes, in fact, a critical funding agency for New Deal programs, that RFC money flows into the New Deal, and then the RFC basically underwrites the Second World War, that through its various subcategories, defense plant corporation and the like, it channels federal funding into 
uh, the, the rearmament uh, program. So it is ultimately the federal agency. I'm actually, I'm never t totally clear on this, and maybe you know, the, the <laughs> RFC, not. did it actually bother going to the issuance of bonds, or simply it was getting funded directly from the Treasury? That's a good question. I'm actually not sure uh, the answer. I'm pretty sure it's the Treasury. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and certainly during the war, Roosevelt was determined to the best he could to sort of keep corporate money out of the funding process uh, and to, you know, ideally pay through taxation the cost of the war. It didn't pan out exactly as he'd hoped, but he, he tried. Yeah. Yes, uh, the WPA also made a tremendous contribution to the arts and culture. Can you comment on that? Yes, this is, um, this is in some ways is the part of the WPA's legacy people are most familiar with. Um, and it's not a lot of the WPA's budget, but it is a very important cultural legacy and uh, is subject to these sort of, uh, you know, unintended consequences or feedback processes uh, that I've been talking about with these other programs. Um, the WPA financed all kinds of really great uh, artistic, musical, theatrical productions here in the city. It also financed a lot of education for young artists uh, by putting unemployed artists to work teaching community classes. One thing I do talk about uh, at pretty decent length in the book is the role this played in the creation of the city center, um, which comes is sort of a Actually, it is kind of a public-private thing in some ways, but what, what uh, happens is LaGuardia loves music, classical and romantic music especially. His father was a band leader. Um, spends election eve listening to rehearsals of the New York Philharmonic. Um, tries to steal the uh, WPA's orchestra and rebrand it as the New York City Orchestra, right? Um, so he has this vision in his head if he's, on the one hand, he wants to use these federal programs and maybe city resources to create venues where working class people can hear good music. Um, and on the other hand, he wants to create something that's going to be like what we think of Lincoln Center as. Um, and uh, over the course of his first two terms, these two impulses kind of merge. In the interim, the WPA has shown that there actually is a popular audience for, um, for classical music and for opera in the city, if the price is affordable. And so in uh, 42, 43, thereabouts, maybe a year later, um, the city comes into possession of the, the building where city center is through tax delinquency. Um, and, uh, and gets this uh, $2 ticket enterprise up and going. It becomes, LaGuardia calls it the, uh, the Cosmopolitan Opera House, because um, everybody can go. Um, but he's tremendously proud of it. But this is something that might not have happened had there been no demonstration by the WPA and its projects here in the city that there was an audience for this sort of thing among working class people. One could also argue that Joe Papp's project of taking Shakespeare free to the public, particularly those early years when he was going to local parks in the Lower East Side and the rest, is a descendant of this. But the, someone who's done a documentary on Papp um, says that he actually claims to have not known anything about that. Uh, you know, he's another generation. But I think, you know, more likely it's the cultural capillaries kind of sort of continue sort of subcutaneously uh, uh, underground uh, memories, in fact. And, and in a sense, what gives New York its, its cultural climate uh, is in fact the legacy of all of those, in the same way that in the, the economic sphere, the repeated demand for public works, well, the repeated demand for public support for the arts uh, is in fact a very old uh, New York City tradition. Uh, we're on this side, I believe. Hi, I just had a question. Why didn't other cities in America during this time have a similar kind of flourishing of New Deal projects? Other cities were very democratic. They were strong mayors in other cities. LaGuardia had headed the U.S. Conference of Mayors to try to push and lobby 
for more of these kind of funds. So why didn't you see this kind of thing in Chicago, for example? I think you did. Um, that's that's my, my short answer is that Chicago actually got more Public Works Administration money per capita and grants than New York did. Uh, Los Angeles was close, if not, uh, if not more. There are cities that chose not to invest their own resources to get these matching grants from the federal government. Uh, Detroit and Philadelphia are two very important examples uh, that are mentioned uh, in the book. Um, but, you know, you get the loop section of the subway in Chicago through the New Deal, parts of the UCLA campus, I think, in Los Angeles, and, and lots of other things. So I really think that New York is not as different in the 30s as we have grown accustomed to thinking. I think it's only the legacy of the New Deal in the 40s and the 50s. Um, that's when New York comes to look a bit different. There's some, you know, I'm smoothing over some differences. Uh, but, uh, but the real sort of distinct thing about New York in the 30s is how the politics of it plays out. The fact that you don't have a Democratic mayor. You have a Republican allied with the labor movement, um, the American Labor Party. Um, the politics works different here in the city in ways that help sustain, along with various social differences, uh, a distinctive politics in the post-war period. There's another dimension, I think, to this national uh, focus question, uh, that in fact what the New Deal does, quite apart from programs aimed at cities, is to develop the infrastructure of the West and the South to a tremendous degree. It's partly ideological. There's this notion of the South as a backward drag on liberal future. Uh, so if in fact we provide unemployment, if we provide power systems, dams, uh, TBAs, if we provide uh, uh, water and power out in the West, we develop the possibility of a flourishing regional economies. And they did, and it was called the Sun Belt. And it turned out in the 1970s, especially with the increased flow of federal resources through the military components uh, of the South and the West development, uh, that one of the reasons New York winds up in big trouble in the mid-1970s uh, is in fact that the New Deal, and then during the war years, New Yorkers were helping critically, along with other northeastern states, to finance the development of the macroeconomy of its contending regions. Two, two additions to that. Uh, number one, it puts in place mechanisms that are going to help finance the growth of the suburbs. Yes. The Federal Housing Administration is created in 1934. It doesn't really do anything until the post-war years because there's not that much new housing construction, comparatively. Um, you know, and all those roads are gone to places, you know, also. That's the that's beginning the work of creating a transportation infrastructure which is going to uh, work to the suburbs' uh, benefit. Um, the other thing is it's the advent of uh, fiscal federalism. Um, you point to the creation of the military-industrial complex, the beginnings of it in the 40s. That's shifting resources out of the richest places in America to places where they're building battleships. But the principle that there can be redistribution from one rich state to a poor state, um, you know, that has happened in some ways through the tariff and other things before the New Deal, but um, the creation of national social insur insurance and, um, you know, in a national sort of incipient welfare state, uh, that all means that uh, federal dollars from, are going to be drawn from New York and sent to, to poorer places also. So in that sense, it is. The New Deal is a Faustian bargain for New York City. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could say a few words about the, the people who were actually designing and administering these projects. I know that uh, Moses seemed, at least from the power broker, hired mostly uh, independent people to do this. And they were all, I guess, city employees. But were there no, none of these uh, companies who did this kind of thing involved in this? Well, this, is a, this question gets to the difference between the PWA and the WPA, actually. Um, construction companies are hired by contract by the city once it gets its PWA grants. The Works Progress Administration hired unemployed workers directly um, so the contractors were kind of cut out, actually, in that sense, uh, th which is one reason that they have to be won over to the idea of federal work relief pretty, uh, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do that. 
um, for precisely that reason. Um, about the, there's not a lot in my book about the people who administer these programs. The, the one point I want to make is that Moses is this like very capable uh, administrator who was able to hire very capable people beneath him, which was very important actually, is something we leave out of the Moses story. Um, you know, he was, he was a force of nature, but he wasn't a, a unique type. Um, there were a lot of very able, uh, qualified, knowledledgeable bureaucrats who came into the LaGuardia administration, came into the city government through the LaGuardia administration. Um, Rice, the uh, secretary, I mean the, um, uh, the commissioner of health is one that comes to mind, Goldwater of hospitals, the docs commissioner, uh, the, um, the markets commissioner who does a lot to get terminal markets up and going in the city himself isn't a great uh, administrator, but the people right beneath him are. So there, there's a lot of administrative talent coming in actually making this stuff work as a consequence of reform coming back into power uh, via LaGuardia. Sure. Yeah, you showed in that uh, chart the various uh, skill sets of people that were employed by the uh, WPA. And what happened to the workers who were unemployable by, by the WPA? Were they given any kind of support or anything? Or? Thank you for raising this. This is a, I am presenting unintentionally, and I think with good purposes, an idealized version of the WPA. I'm not, not idealized, but the best faces of it, or you know, or the most popular faces of it, or, or, or whatever. The WPA, the federal government apparently seemed at least to make a commitment to giving a job to every employable person who uh, was without work. The rest of that population would be uh, taken care of by cities and counties. So that's the first thing, all right? There's a distinction between people who can work and people who, who can't. Uh, second, it didn't come anywhere near providing jobs for everybody who wanted a, a WPA job. And a lot of the people who, were, who lost out there um, ended up on city relief. So they're cut out. Some of them later get WPA jobs. Uh, but the WPA has never financed to the extent that it can employ everybody who wanted a WPA job. There are all sorts of inequalities built into the WPA. Only one WPA employee uh, per household. So women who might want to work cut out of the WPA if their husbands are employed. Um, and then, uh, oh, lastly, okay, so you had to pass the means test to get on WPA. Unlike an earlier New Deal program, the Civil Works Administration, where you could just go and get hired as if it were a normal job, you got to get certified as being in need, and you had to be really destitute um, to be certified by local authorities before you could get on WPA. So a lot of people just don't want to submit to that. They don't want people coming and examining their apartments and looking at their bank accounts and their insurance policies, which I don't think they can even have, actually. Um, so that artificially, in some ways, restricts who's eligible to participate in WPA. It's, it's meant, you know, with good intentions to channel the money to the people who are most destitute. But that also means there are a lot of people who can't work uh, on WPA as a result. So there are all sorts of insufficiencies with that program vis-a-vis -vis its own goals. Yeah. Sir. Class um, is self-eliminating self in this equation, but uh, we have not talked about race. And how, what impact did race have in, across the board in this equation? This, this topic is just endlessly complicated. Even in New York, if you look at the nation as a whole in the New Deal, oh my goodness. Um, let's talk about LaGuardia first. He wanted to believe that black communities and African Americans faced the same challenges that his own Italian American population had in the early 20th century. That black New Yorkers were just the newest arrivals in the city and that their experience would be somewhat like the experience of the Italian community. By the 1940s, he realizes that that's not realistic. Um, context matters and it's, uh, it, it becomes very complicated, but his own ideas, set of ideas about that subject break down. Uh, in New York, New York is sort of a case study of just how, uh, how progressive, if you want to use that word, uh, the New Deal could be on racial issues. 
which is still not all that progressive. <laughs> um, these programs are administered in such a way that black people have a fair shake eventually getting onto WPA. Um, they're administered in such a way that the federal government and the city are providing real benefits uh, in black communities. Um, some of these are detailed in the book and they produce a very strong electoral reaction. Many, many, many black New Yorkers go to the polls for the first time to vote for Roosevelt for re-election in 36, to vote for LaGuardia for re-election in 37. Um, but they are still ultimately not uh, taking actions sufficient to meet what those communities feel are problems that are legitimate uh, causes for action by the government. And uh, partly because of that, LaGuardia presides over two of the most destructive riots in the history of the city. You mentioned, uh, on race, you mentioned that the Williamsburg housing was, was segregated. Mm -hmm. By what mechanism was it segregated? I'll tell you why first, which is that, um, you know, the people who were are, who are overseeing the housing authority then were good people. Um, they, they wanted to treat black people like anybody else. The reason that project was still segregated was that public housing was very new. They were worried about building a political constituency for it. And they thought that if they engaged in what they would have seen as social engineering, that this would be impossible. It's the same reason that LaGuardia later acceded to a, a Jim Crow tenant policy in Stuyvesant Town. Said once we get this program off the ground, then we can desegregate it. We have to get it off the ground first. If we start dealing with the, the segregation aspect first, it's gonna hold up the, the project. LaGuardia was very widely admired by moderate um, civil rights leaders uh, in the city. And they, as you would imagine, um, we're just shocked by that attitude vis-a-vis um, -vis Stuyvesant Town. Um, and uh, then, then, you know, only at that moment does he really sort of start to realize what he's done, really. Um, so uh, so that, that's why I think they did it. In terms of mechanisms, you just, you know, they got 10 applications for every vacancy that existed in the place, and it's not that hard to sort through uh, and choose the tenants you want in that circumstance. Uh, the sides have faltered center. This is your moment. Yeah. <laughs> now you, you, you will have to, to well, I, I, they can't get there from here. Um, the last, shoot. Just shout it up here. You repeat the question. Rural electrification, yes. Major, major legacy of the New Deal. Uh, factors, factors very little into my history of the New Deal in New York, but, um, yeah, it wasn't urban. There's modern agricultural policy comes out of this period in some ways. That's not urban either. Um, there's, uh, there's all sorts of stuff happening in places other than urban areas. I hope I didn't create the impression that the New Deal was primarily an urban undertaking uh, because, well, in some ways it was, in some ways it wasn't. But, you know, it's a national project that does stuff all over the country. The, the, the PWA... Um, the historian Jason Scott Smith has noted, built structures in all but three counties in the United States. So that's how deep into communities across the country these programs get. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly, by all means, I mean, absolutely, there's, there's a lot going on everywhere during this period. Maybe one last question. Nobody on the sidelines going in the center. Uh, right, yes? Right Mm -hmm. for the uh, beauty of the children who could enjoy the beauty of the work. And it was very fascinating to see these beautiful sculptures and paintings all over. Some of the murals are still there. You can go visit them if you want, yeah. Well, thank you so much, people. I, I remind you that books are on sale and that their author will rendezvous with you out there. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thanks again for inviting me.